Well, let me ask you a few questions to get us into this text. And, um, and actually, but truth be known, I'm not going to... I'm not going to spend time in this text, but I'm going to look at some texts um, surrounding this particular one. Um, what did you have to do to become a human being? What did you have to do? Did you have to fill out a form to become a human being? Uh, no. Did you, have to, did you have to go online and uh, fill out um, an online survey? Uh, again, no. Did you have to take a course? You know, become a human, 101 and then 201. Um, take a course to become human? Uh, no. Did you have to pass a test? And some of us, uh, thank the Lord, we, there was no test. You know who you are. Um, you know who you are. Wouldn't have made it. Um, or we know who we are. Um, so, no, you had to do nothing to become a human being. You were, you were carried by your mom and cared for by your mom that's how you became human. Now, let me ask you another question. Did anyone here, did anyone here change their name? Change their first name? No. What did you do to receive your name? What did you have to do? Nothing. You know, you, you probably, here's what happened. You, you, you probably, someone was, they, people started calling you, hey Tommy, hey Tommy, hey Andrew, and they would say it enough and enough, and you'd finally be going, you're talking to me? You, you, you'd think this, right? You're talking to me. So you'd finally connect, hey, they look at me, and they say this name, it must be my name, right? You did nothing to receive your name. Now, what did you have to do to receive this postcard that says, valued reader? What did you have to do to receive that? Nothing. Live at a certain place, maybe, open your mailbox, and boom, it's free, right? You get it. It used to say occupant, now it says valued reader. So you might be a valued reader. Um, you did nothing. So we did nothing to become human, nothing to get our name, nothing to get postcards, um, as nice as that is. Um, so let me ask a little deeper question. So now you, you kind of got the gist of this, right? In Mark 2, that I did not read to you, there's a story about Jesus teaching in this, in this house. And this house was so packed, so crowded, there, it was standing room only. It was kind of like the mall on, on Black Fridays, trying to get into that store with the deals, right? Standing room only. You couldn't get in. Here's what happened. You, you couldn't even get in the door, right? So these faith-filled guys, they get really creative. And they carry their friend on a mat. He, uh, this, this guy is paralyzed. It's called a paralytic. He's paralyzed. He can't move. He can't do anything but lay on this mat. So his friends climb up on the roof, and they dig through the roof, and they lower the guy down to Jesus where he's teaching. Now, so they, they acted like a mom to this guy because they cared for him, they carried him, and they carved out a roof and put him in front of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He touched him and healed him. He touched him and healed him. Now, Jesus looked at the guy's, at the guy's faith, and then he healed their friend. He looked at their faith and healed, the, healed their friend. Now, Jesus did not call the Roman cops. He didn't write them up for vandalism. Say, you know, he didn't berate him, say, hey guys, what's up with the destroying the roof, right? He didn't talk about that at all. He healed their friend. He saw their faith, healed their friend. So, so here's the thing. Their faith, they put their friend in, the, in, in Jesus' arms. They led him, they carried him to God's grace in Jesus Christ. Now, what did the guy have to do? well, not fall off the mat and break another rib or something, but, you know, he, all he had to do was stay on the mat. He did nothing to receive this grace. Nothing. So, so here's the thing. Here's where we're going with all this. We are here to worship and respond to God's grace in our lives. That's what, that's what worship is all about, is, is responding, saying, look, God's grace has filled me, has changed me, has made me his child, that's what his grace has done in my life. 
We're here, and you know what? When we come to worship, when we come here, it's countercultural. It's countercultural. Worship is countercultural to come and respond to God's grace. It's countercultural. And so let me give you a couple of, a couple of for, for instances here. Um, here is a classic iPod. Classic iPod. Here is an iPod Touch, an iPod. Here is, a, um, here is an iPad. And here is a iPhone. These, these, an iPod, an iPhone, an iPad, you know what? These are, these are icons of our culture. Ip icons of our culture because this is an I culture. This is all about, this is I, 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 I. This is what I've done. I'm very proud of what I've done. And, we, and you could probably say that yourself. I've done this. I've done that. It's all about I. You know, I have two master's degrees. I flew supersonic in a T-38. I flew a C-130 around the world and didn't die. I've been to over 40 countries in the world. I retired as a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. And you know what? That's all rubbish. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. That is not I do. That is God's grace working in my life. That's God's grace. And by God's grace, he worked in your life. So God has poured out his grace on me. Richly, richly, richly poured out his grace on you. So we are responding to God's grace in our lives. And that's why we're here. That's why this day is so special as we respond to God's grace in Andrew's life. It's, it's, it, let, me, let me give you the backstory on this. Is God always is pouring out his grace. God spoke the world into existence. God spoke you into existence. You know, God's grace, you, you, what, you didn't do anything. Here you are, right? It's his grace that, that, that made you, made you in his image, and made you beautiful in his sight. So God created, and guess what? All the way back in Genesis 17, that Tom read, God was, God was breathing out a covenant. God's grace, he was pouring out his grace on Abram. And what did he say to Abraham? He says, my covenant is with you and your children and your children's children. My covenant of grace is with you and your children and your children's children. So and he says, I'm going to make you my people. And I'm going to give you a sign that you're my people. And that sign was circumcision. So on the eighth day, the boys were circumcised, and he goes, you know what? It's like a new ID card. It's like, you're part of the covenant. The covenant of grace in Jesus Christ is the, the mark. You're in my family. You're in my family. And so, so that's what now, let's, let's, that's what his covenant of grace was then. Now let's fast forward it to the New Testament times. And we, you already said it a couple times, and um, you, you heard it, when Peter was preaching his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, he, he, said, he said, after he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, you know, even your children, he, said, um, he says, your promise is for your children and for all those who are far off, all those who the Lord will call. So he actually says it in verse 39, this promise is for you and for your children and all who God will call who are, who are far off. So even, even the, uh, the historian Oregon of Alexandria wrote in the second century that, that baptisms of infants was happening in the first century. He wrote that um, back in about the year 200, something like that. Now here's some, here's some texts that I didn't read these. In Acts 16, two stories, two stories. The first is about Lydia. Lydia, the dealer of purple, Lydia of Thyatira, was in Philippi. And she heard Peter preaching, at, 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 or, or Paul, I forget who. He, he, she heard preaching, she heard the word taught, and she responded. It says, the Lord opened her heart, and then she took the, this was Paul, took the apostles home, and her whole household was baptized. So, who opened her heart? The Lord, God's grace. Who was baptized? Her whole household. And households included children. Second one, not many verses later in Acts 16, the, Philipp the Philippian jailer. We heard this story before. Paul and Silas were chained, they're in prison, 
an earthquake happens and it breaks the chains, they could all run out and leave. The jailer goes, I'm doomed. I'm going to be killed. He's ready to kill himself. And Paul and Silas go, don't do that. We're all still here. And he, he falls on his knees and goes, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, you and your household. So it said that night, that night, he took them home, he washed their wounds, and he, the jailer, and his whole household, household was baptized. So, so we, we understand that we're responding. We don't do it. We don't do anything but receive God's grace. We're here to worship God's grace, and we're covered with God's grace, and we, we, that's why we bring children to um, baptism. So, what do we do now? What do we do? I say, I, I think there's three things that we do. One, first thing is we acknowledge the grace of God in our lives. We, we acknowledge. We're not lone rangers. You know, we're not self-made. None of us are self-made. It's God's grace working in and through you that, that brings you here. So, acknowledge God's grace in your life. Second, we respond to God's grace by worship. That's why we come every week and worship and thank God and go, Lord, you're amazing the way you pour out your grace on us. I, I, I can't do this on my own power. Only in you and through you is this possible. So we respond to God's grace that way. And finally, finally, this is good. It, in the Shema, that's Deuteronomy 6, it says this, that, that, you, that, you should, that you should love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul. And, and it says you should, you should follow these commands and you should impress them on your heart and you should teach them to your children and it says you should, you should talk about these when you sit at home, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, and when you get up. And when we do that, you already said we're going to help Andrew. You're going to help Andrew be raised as a, uh, as a child of God. And you know what? Here's the final little story. Is this. You all know Carson. Right? You all know Carson? Carson is a wild, creative, funny little boy. And he often, he gets immersed, he gets immersed in Terry's arms every Sunday, mostly to keep him still. But <laughs> he gets immersed in the love and the grace of God. He does. And all the children do. They come here and they get immersed in God's grace. Here's what happens in, in the real life. Carson wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to God, and he read it to Terry, and Terry translated it um, <laughs> so I could read it to you. Here's what God's grace does. It says, God, I hope you are safe in heaven, and I hope you have fun, and I hope you like hope and fun, and I love you, and I believe. Carson. I love you and I believe. Signed Carson. That's what God's grace does. That's what God's grace does to little children. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for your grace. Thanks for your undeserved, unmerited, unwarranted grace that you pour out in your son Jesus Christ. Thanks for what is a baptism that mark us as your children of grace, your covenant in your family. Amen.